Denny pressed the phone to one ear and covered his other ear with his hand, straining to hear through the crowd noise. Bronco tells me you paid him. Denny recognized Hank's voice. His stomach did somersaults. Right, Denny said, right. And I'll pay you too. Today? Even with the noise around him, Denny caught the threat in that one word. I can't get the money out of the bank until Monday, Denny said. I'll pay you then. I've heard that before. I'm not stringing you along, Hank. I, sw Hank, I swear. I'll bring your money first thing Monday morning. I'll probably regret this, Hank said. But you have until Monday noon. After that, no excuses. I'll be there, Denny promised. He put the phone in his pocket and paced nervously. Winston and Celia were his only hope. But the last time Denny had tried to borrow from them, Winston had said, Get yourself some help with your problems first. Stop gambling and learn how to get along with people so you can hold a job. Denny had sworn he would do so even though he knew he didn't have any problem. He could quit gambling any time he wanted. He had a string of bad luck, that's all. The only people he didn't get along with were the jerks of the world, who seemed to be everywhere. They had the problem, not him. Celia and Winston often urged Denny to get some professional help. Once, after Denny threatened to shoot a driver who cut him off in traffic, Celia had given him a phone number to call. You need to help to control your temper, Celia said, before you hurt someone. Denny's blood boiled as he remembered how Celia and Winston had jumped all over him when the other driver was at fault. Denny had thrown the number away. It would be different today. Celia and Winston would be sympathetic when they found out Denny needed money for Matt. They knew how much it cost to raise kids. He'd say he needed it to buy clothes and a bed for Matt. He'd say he had custody of the boy and needed cash to take Matt to the doctor and buy allergy medicine. He'd say he had an interview next week for a real job with a steady paycheck because more than anything, he wanted to take care of his boy. They'd agree to help him this time instead of lecturing Denny to change his ways. But what if they didn't? What if Winston and Celia said no? What if Celia threw a fit because Denny had never paid back the last loan? What if they had somehow found out about his time in prison? Hank and his partner could get mean. If Denny didn't come up with the cash by Monday, he would have to hide out for a while. The money from the merchandise he returned wasn't nearly enough to pay off Hank. He'd already spent part of it on lotto tickets. He watched people buying refreshments, then he read p the posted prices. Six bucks for a beer? Cash flowed all around him, but Denny's pockets were nearly empty. He had to get enough money from Winston and Celia not only to pay off Hank, but also place some bets on next week's races. He had a hot tip on one race. He'd have big bucks soon. Winning felt better than anything else in the world. He fidgeted, watching the people, resenting the easy way they purchased hot dogs and drinks. Why should foolish fans in baseball caps be able to afford what he could not? He itched to walk, talk to Winston and Celia hit him up for a loan, and tuck the che check safely in his pocket. When he got home tomorrow, Denny would prepare to move. His rent was already a week overdue. He had to leave before the landlord came to collect. Children weren't allowed in the complex. The landlord would notice Matt. He'd pay Hank Monday morning and then hit the road. The Monday money from Winston and Celia would give him a fresh start. Maybe he and Matt would go back to Reno, where the gambling was good. A new idea struck him. He could say Matt needs surgery, and there's no sur insurance on him. Surgery's expensive, at least $10,000. Without much money, he and Matt could fly to Reno. He'd use one of his fake IDs for the plane. Excited by this surefire plan, Denny rushed back to his seat. They would leave right now. Catch an earlier ferry. and give Winston and Celia more time to get over their shock about Matt before Denny asked for the money. Denny sat beside Matt and said, Come on, kid, we're going. Now? The bases are loaded and the game is tied. We have to catch the ferry. Let's go. Reluctantly, Matt stood and followed Denny, just as he heard a sharp crack as the bat hit the baseball. A grand slam. The crowd exploded. Matt cheered and clapped as he watched the players round the bases. Quit stalling! Denny grabbed Matt's arm and pulled him along. Don't get your hopes up, Bonnie told herself. This isn't a mystery novel. You aren't the brilliant girl detective who saves her brother from the crook. 
She walked as fast as she could, dodging fans, carrying cardboard trays full of food. The concourse was crowded, so she wondered if anyone was still watching the game, until a huge roar arose from the stadium. From the television monitor, she heard Dave Neheis, the Mariners announcer, shout, Get out the rye bread and mustard, Grandma. It's a grand salami time. A grand slam. The crowd was going crazy. The first Mariners game of my life, Bonnie thought. I'm missing the best part because I'm on a wild goose chase after a kid with black hair and glasses who looks a little bit like my brother. But she didn't turn back. When she was on one aisle from where the boy had been sitting, she decided she was close enough to get a really good look at him without actually confronting him. She walked up the seating area and turned her binoculars toward the seats, one section to her left. She moved them back and forth, but didn't find the boy. She scanned the crowd again, more slowly, and saw two girls who had sat beside the boy. The girls were still jumping and screaming. This time, there were two empty seats beside them. The boy was gone. Maybe he's using the restroom, Bonnie thought. She returned to the concourse area, looked in both directions, but it was hard to spot a small boy amid so many adults. Donnie, Bonnie hesitated. Should she go talk to those girls? Ask them if the boy had told them his name? Little kids are friendly. He might have talked to them. Of course, if Matt had dyed his hair and glasses and had glasses and new clothes on, he probably had a different name as well. Whoever had taken him wouldn't let him use the name Matt Schulter anymore. But Matt would never go along with such a pretense unless his abductor was there with him. Make liked seeing the moose dance on the dugout and the computer hydroplane race on the big screen. He does have a gun, Matt whispered. He wears it on a strap across his chest. Bonnie wondered how Denny had made it through the security check at the gate with a handgun under his sweatshirt. Mrs. Tagg's tote bag full of peanuts and granola bars had been thoroughly searched and her water bottle confiscated. Well, it didn't matter how he smuggled the gun in the ball game. What mattered was preventing him from using it. She put her hand on Matt's shoulder and walked with him toward the exit. Denny Thurman stayed directly behind them. What about Mom? Matt asked. Is she alive, too? Did she get well after the accident? Mom wasn't in an accident. She wasn't? Denny talked to Mrs. Watson and she said, Be quiet, Denny said angrily. Bonnie looked at her brother's face, glowing with happiness, and understood why he had sat alone in the crowd without asking for help and why he never called home. Denny must have told Matt that she and Mom had been killed. Even though they were in terrible trouble, Matt looked happy because his danger mattered less to him than learning his mother and sister were alive. Poor Matt, she thought. He must have felt so sad and alone. She wondered if he had nightmares. They exited the stadium near the sculpture of the baseball mitt, where Bonnie and her friends had posed for a picture. They walked past the stadium to the corner, where a motorcycle policeman was ready to direct traffic at the end of the game. A few other people stood on the curb, waiting to cross the street. Bonnie stared at the police officer, willing him to look her way. This is Matt, she wanted to shout. This is the boy who's been missing. Help us. Don't say a word, Denny whispered. Bonnie tried to make eye contact with the officer, but he only blew his whistle and waved for the people to cross the street. The wind picked up and dark clouds covered the sun again. Bonnie buttoned her coat. As they stepped off the curb, Bonnie reached for Matt's hand. For the last few months, he had objected when Mom or Bonnie tried to take his hand, claiming, I'm not a baby anymore. I know how to watch for cars. Today, he slipped his hand quickly into Bonnie's. His warm fingers entwined with hers, and when they reached the other side of the street, neither Bonnie nor Matt let go. By the time they'd walked a few blocks, the other pedestrians had turned up a side street. Pedestrians had turned up side of the street or had reached their cars and driven away. Denny, Matt, A lot of odd things happening. She leaned closer and whispered so that none of her customers could hear. There are two actors headed toward the bath men's room right now. And they're going to... 
a lot of odd things happening. She leaned closer and whispered so none of the customers could hear. There are two actors heading toward the men's room right now, and they're going to stage a fake robbery. Your son will be terrified. I'll take him to the ladies' room, Bonnie said. I can't go in the girls' bathroom, Matt said. Yes, you can. She squeezed Matt's hand, holding her breath and hoping that Denny would say yes. Maybe a customer would be in there and Bonnie could tell the woman who she was. Someone in the restroom might even have a cell phone and Bonnie could call the police. Denny looked at Bonnie, his eyes narrow. Come right back, he said, and don't talk to anyone. He put his hand inside his sweatshirt as he spoke. Do you understand? Bonnie nodded. She understood perfectly. Ladies is right down the hall, said Miss Clueless. Bonnie walked that way with Matt beside her. There was no one else in the restroom. Matt went in a stall. Bonnie squirted liquid soap on her finger and wrote on the mirror, Help! Denny Thurman! Kidnapped! That's as far as she got when the door opened and two matronly women entered. Bonnie felt faint with relief. You have to help me, she told the women. My brother was abducted and now the man's making me go with him. He's out there right now waiting for us and he has a gun. The words tumbled from her lips as she pleaded with the woman. Call the police. Tell them where we are. Tell them that we're with Denny Thurman. The two women smiled at each other, clearly delighted by what Bonnie had said. A clue in the ladies' room, one said to the other. I didn't expect that. Let's go tell the boys, the other woman said. We can freshen our makeup later. This isn't a clue, Bonnie said. This is real. Call the police. But the woman, laughing, went back out. One spoke over her shoulder to Bonnie as they left. You did a fine job, dear, she said. And you're so young to be an actress.